A bright light is shining in your eyes. A dozen live broadcasting cameras are pointing at your face. The television host is just about to ask you the first question, and your heart is pounding in your chest. You stop for a moment and ask yourself, how on earth did I end up here? This was us too a few months ago. We were two high school students, supposedly proving NASA wrong in our final, final science project about the aerodynamics of model rockets. So what exactly did we examine? What we looked at was the so-called drag coefficient of a model rocket. The drag coefficient describes how aerodynamic an object is and is heavily dependent on the shape of the object. The drag coefficient is found in the so-called drag equation, where CD is the drag coefficient. The larger this number is, the greater is the air resistance. And the lower this number is, the weaker is the air resistance. So in short, to make a rocket fly higher and faster, you want a low coefficient. And what we found was that on NASA's official web page, they stated, and I quote, a typical value for the drag coefficient of a mile rocket is 0.75. And we thought, this can't be true. If we put this into perspective, consider a streamlined sports car where the designers have tweaked and changed every millimeter to perfection to make the car go as fast as possible. What does it have? 0.25. Now, Consider a ball. You can throw a ball, but it isn't very aerodynamic. What does it have? 0.50. So H Hang on. Since 0.50 is less than 0.75, that would mean that a ball, something that is short and compact, would be more aerodynamic than a rocket, something that is long and thin and designed to travel through air. That doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. And here comes the mind-puzzling part. We know, some, we know another object that has a drag coefficient of around 0.75, and that object is a trash can. <laughs> Absurd. It doesn't make any sense. So we wanted to determine the real number for the drag coefficient of a mile rocket. So let's say a car company wants to determine the drag coefficient of the new car. Then you have a huge wind tunnel. They put their car in, they blow wind at a certain speed, and they measure that drag force. Then I plug it into the equation, and bam, they get a number. That's easy. So of course, we wanted to do this for the model rockets that we built. So we called Volvo, who's just around the corner, and we asked them, hey, we're two science students. We're doing a project. Could we use your wind tunnel? No. But Chalmers, they have a wind tunnel, right? Yeah, they do. So we called Chalmers up and asked, hey, we're two science students. We're doing a project. Could we use your wind tunnel? No. <laughs> so we had to think again. And we know that when something is falling, it's accelerating due to the pull of gravity. And as this object picks up speed, the air resistance grows greater and greater. And eventually, the air resistance will be just as great as the pull of gravity and it reaches its terminal velocity. And the terminal velocity is directly connected to the drag coefficient. If you know one, you know the other. So if we could determine the terminal velocity for our rockets, we would be good to go. But in order to achieve terminal velocity, you would have to drop them from a height of a couple of kilometers, and they will be crashing down in crazy speeds. Not very practical. But we figured, the acceleration on the rocket will change throughout the fall. And if we only could measure how the acceleration changed at the very beginning of the fall, we could then calculate what it would be at the very end. And how do you measure acceleration? With an accelerometer. If we had an accelerometer, we could do all this. We have solved the problem.
So we went to our tutor and asked, do you have an accelerometer? No. <laughs> so in the end, what we did was, since we couldn't afford an accelerometer, is we made our own. We bought two small chips, we soldered them together, we wrote the software in order to make it log the data, and we could then put this inside our rockets. And then we needed a place to drop them, preferably inside. And we found a place here in Gothenburg where we could drop them from the eighth floor. Well, then Simon and I, we got there, and Simon was quite quick to say, Carl, it's better if I'm upstairs. You'll be downstairs. <laughs> so then he took the rockets, he went into the elevator, he rode up the eight stairs, he got out, he then carefully looked over the edge, he took one of the rockets, he inserted it in this mechanism we built, he then stood back, he had three, two, one, and he pulled the wire and the rocket fall, fell. And there, eight floors down, I stand with an old bed sheet, <laughs> trying to catch these as they're falling down, they have a speed of about 80 kilometers an hour. And we did this 20 times. And we also dropped a ball. A ball, you might wonder, why would we drop a ball? But since we came up with this method ourselves, we had to validate that it worked. And since, and since we know what a ball should have, we know that if our method yields the same results, we know that our method is correct. So we analyzed our data, and we came to some interesting results. For, for the ball, which should have 0.50, we got 0.54, which is very close. And for our rockets, which NASA claimed should have 0.75, we got 0.30, which is much more reasonable. And with this project, we took part in a national science competition for young science projects. And we actually won that competition. And our prize was to compete in the world's largest competition for young science projects in Phoenix, Arizona, against students from 70 different countries from all around the globe. So just before we're going to fly to America, that's when we are interviewed on the national morning show on TV. And we were nervous then. We were. But we were not close to as nervous as we were a few days later. It was at the competition in the US. It was Judges' Day, which meant judges were walking around, looking at the projects, and interrogating you. And we managed fine throughout the day. It went all right. But at the end of the day, we saw one judge walking down the aisle. He had a shaved head, was wearing a blue shirt, with a big NASA logo on his chest. <laughs> he suddenly stopped. He saw our title. It said, could NASA be wrong, in giant letters. <laughs> he then crossed his arms, and he walked up to us and said, all right, guys, what are we wrong about? So the NASA engineer was skeptical at first, but after a short time, he too was, conv he too was convinced that the number was strangely large. So we looked at our poster, at the reference source for this number. And he took up his iPad and logged on to some NASA network. And soon enough, he gave us the professional email address to the very person who was responsible for our number. And so excited we were. A year's work, hundreds of hours about this tiny number. We wrote an email, we attached our study, and we clicked that send button. And quite soon, we got a reply. We Sorry, the email address was not found. <laughs> So where does this leave us? We have a substantial amount of data that tests that something is wrong with NASA's number. The web pages where this information can be found has been virtually untouched since the guy who wrote them retired. No one seems to be picking up where his work left off. And this, at this point, you might ask, why does it matter? It's just a tiny, insignificant number that no one will notice. But no. This number is constantly being quoted all around the web. Everyone interested in rocket building refers back to this page. And as far as we can tell, no one is questioning it, because it's NASA. 
This is the Bible of rocketry. But we not only questioned the number, we set out to find the real answer. If something seems wrong to you with the information you're being fed, then stand up and question it, even if you have next to no resources like us. Our research produced a different result than what the accepted truth is. And someone's got to be wrong. And between you and us, we're pretty sure it's NASA. Thank <laughs> you.